Welcome to Sightseeing Japan, the podcast where we explore the land of sticky rice. I'm Paul Brasson. And I'm Jason Neeling. And today we are talking about mochi, which is a chewy, stretchy, doughy, dumpling sort of food made from rice. It's one way to describe it. How would you, <laughs> how, how would you describe it, Paul? Um, yeah, I mean, it Japanese is... rice cakes made from a kind of dough from pounded steamed rice. Okay. That's a little more detail. Sure. It's still like, you gotta like taste mochi and hold mochi yeah. to really understand mochi. Yeah. It's got a really interesting consistency and texture. Yeah. Stretchy. It's good stuff. So I would say that most Americans that have heard of mochi probably associate it with mochi ice cream, right? Yeah, that's, I think, the most popular kind here. Yeah, you got a little ball of ice cream, and it's kind of all held together by a layer of mochi wrapped around it. Mm -hmm. You see it a lot in sushi restaurants or other Japanese restaurants. Common dessert. Yeah, and mochi is kind of like an umbrella term. There's a, so many different kinds of mochi yeah, that have a lot of different other ingredients involved, but they're still mochi. Right. The word mochi refers to the rice dough part. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's the first way I ever ate mochi was the mochi ice cream. But in Japan, there's so many different types of mochi dishes, and it even has a lot of significance in Japanese culture and religious rituals. Yeah, it does. It's one of those things where every region has their own mochi specialty, um, and it's widely used at home cooking too. So every household probably has its own ways of eating mochi. Mm -hmm. uh, it's everywhere in Japan. Yeah. One very important holiday that mochi is associated with is New Year's, which is why we're doing this episode now. Happy New Year's, Happy everybody. Happy New Year's! Here's hoping that 2021 is a, a little better than 2020, because that was a rough year, man. Not looking good so far, but you know, we'll see. Yeah, it has been a rough year, man. Yeah. But life goes on. So in this episode, we're going to learn about where mochi came from, how it's made, what it can be made into, and its significance in Japan. Let's talk about the history of mochi. Okay. As rice cultivation originated probably in China, so as well did mochi. Yeah, the main ingredient for mochi, glutinous rice, has been grown in China for thousands of years. Apparently, there were aboriginal tribes in China that made mochi as a part of their traditions. So it's a very old idea, associating this food with traditions and, and religious stuff, sounds like. In Japanese folklore, it's said that the first mochitsuki ceremony, mochi-making ceremony, occurred after the kami, the gods, descended to earth, which would have been during the yayoi period around 2,000 years ago, not too long after rice was first introduced to Japan. So it sounds like mochi has a l very long history in Japan. And as with so many things when they are first introduced to Japan, at first the only people eating it were the emperors and nobles. And also, when new things are introduced, they often gain religious significance. So even at this point, mochi was seen as a symbol of good fortune. They believed that a divine presence dwelled within mochi, and it was seen as a sacred food, and still is. During the Heian period, which was 794 to 1192, mochi was used as a food for the gods and in religious offerings and Shinto rituals performed by aristocrats because they had that mochi monopoly going early on. Mm -hmm. Mochi also became known as a talisman for happy marriages. Ooh. I saw that even today, sometimes at weddings, they will make mochi. Okay. Uh, the nobles in the imperial court believed that long strands of freshly made mochi symbolized long life and well-being, and that dried mochi help strengthen their teeth. Sure. Which, not sure is true, but, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> I could see it giving your jaw muscles a workout at the very least. Yeah. I don't know if teeth get stronger, though. Teeth aren't a muscle. <laughs> sure, yeah. Red rice was the original base for mochi. 
apparently. Yeah, red mochi. Interesting. Yeah. Mochi is described in Japan's oldest novel, The Tale of Genji. So that's pretty cool. It was uh, popular enough to be written about that long ago. It has been a big deal for a long time. The Heian period was also when mochi first started to be associated with the New Year's holiday. Yeah. During the Muromachi period, which was uh, 1336 to 1573, mochi made its way into the tea ceremony as a sweet eaten with green tea. So there's some more cultural significance there. Mm -hmm. And during the Sengoku period, the warring states period of Japan that came after that, mochi became a staple snack as it was quick, easy source of calories and nutrition. Samurai would often carry it with them as they traveled for just an easy calorie source. Yeah, you know, I was really surprised at how calorie dense mochi apparently is. I saw that like a matchbox size chunk of mochi has the same calories as a whole bowl of rice. Yeah. I mean, as we get into how to make it, you're basically pounding a bowl of rice into a little ball. Yeah. So it I mean, kind of makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. But that's really cool. Like uh, mm -hmm. having some calorie dense thing that doesn't spoil easily. Yeah. Uh, a very useful thing, right? Absolutely. So yeah, we talked about, you know, all these different ways that mochi was used and this symbolism that it took on over the years. And a lot of that stuff remains today. You know, they still use it in New Year's events. They use it in decorations, all sorts of foods, a lot of traditions that are still around. Yeah. So let's talk about how to make mochi, right? Yeah. You got to start with the rice. You do. And, and it's want... a special kind of rice. Yes, exactly. You're going to start with something called mochi gome, which is mochi rice. It is a short grain Japonica glutinous rice. And you might hear that word glutinous and think, oh, that's talking about gluten, right? This is like rice with gluten in it. But no, no rice has gluten in it. Yeah. Mochi is a gluten free food. Yeah. The glutinous part of the name just means it's sticky. It's just an adjective that means sticky, sticky rice. Yeah, and you can use brown rice or white rice or red rice. So that's cool. Yeah, it's got to be glutinous. Long grain rice doesn't seem to work as well. Okay. You want that short, sticky rice. Yeah. So first thing you're going to do with this rice is soak it, usually overnight, maybe even longer. And then you're going to steam it. Mm-hmm. And then once you got this steamed glutinous rice, now comes the fun part, because you got to smash that stuff. Yeah. You got to stick the rice in a mortar, and someone's going to take a big wooded mallet called the kine, and they're going to wham, smack the rice. Mm -hmm. I think first you have to like mash it kind of before you start slamming it with that mallet. You got to kind of just mash it a little bit first, right? You're right. You're right. You, mash, you mash it up, and then you pound it. Yeah. And you're going to just keep pounding it until it's like smooth and silky and stretchy. I saw that it usually takes about half an hour for a batch. That's intensive work. You're swinging this big mallet. Yeah. And it takes two people. One is pounding the rice with the mallet and the other one is turning it and wetting it with water. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible. Like you should go watch a video on YouTube or Definitely. wherever of someone making this. They literally are going like, wham, 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 wham with the mallet. And in between that, the other person is reaching their hand in there and moving the rice and getting it wet. The timing has to be perfect. Like you both just have to be in absolute rhythm or somebody's hands getting broken. Right. Yeah. I saw people would chant so that they kind of have this rhythm going. And, you know, if they're really good, they can get it so, so fast that it's like, wham, 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 wham. And this other person is getting yeah. their hand in there between each hit. It's insane. Yeah, they're basically swinging the wood of mallet like as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. And the other person's hands are just flying in and out. In a, I think they just dip their hands like in water mm -hmm. and then like move the rice back in the water, move the rice. Like, yeah. It's so cool. They do it for ceremonies and stuff. So it's kind of a big display mm -hmm. often when people do it. So the, you might have a chance to see it actually happen in real life. Yeah, and there's some like mochi shops that will do this out front to kind of uh, draw in customers. Like they make a big spectacle of it. 
those are some of the kinds of videos you could find on YouTube. They'll make it out front and do it really fast, and it's just super impressive. Yeah. So after you pound it for a while, you've got this sticky mass that is cut and formed into shapes. Mm-hmm. You can do spheres or whatever. There's many, many forms of mochi. Yeah, we'll talk about some of the many, many types uh, a little later on. Uh, you can also like mix stuff into the mochi to make it different colors or give it a different kind of flavor. So that's the traditional method, right? That's how they were making mochi for hundreds and hundreds of years. But You know, these days they mass produce mochi. You can get it in stores all over the place. I'm sure you can find some in your local Asian market pretty much no matter where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. And this traditional method is really only making small batches and it takes a lot of effort and time. So when they're mass producing it, they're using machines generally. Yep. And they're not really making it from whole rice anymore. They're usually making it from sweet rice flour called mochiko. Yeah. So they just mix that with water to create the dough. Yep. So that's kind of sad. I mean, that's kind of how it always goes when you're talking about mass production, economies of scale, that kind of thing. But it turns out pretty well. I mean, it's still good stuff, but I have heard that the older generations in Japan can still tell the difference and it's getting harder and harder to find mochi that tastes like it did when they were kids, you know, like they remember it. That's probably true, but that also kind of just sounds like old people. <laughs> Not to be offensive, but you know, like, uh, back in my day, <laughs> we made mochi better than it is now. Sure. sure. They're probably right. Though, it makes me case. curious, though. I, I want to try some of that. Like, I, I actually want to go see somebody make it and then eat it like immediately while we it's still warm. We should just make our own, dude. We could do that, too. My rhythm's not great, though. I don't really want to get my hand crushed. <laughs> so we can go slowly. Okay. I know you have good rhythm, Mr. Drummer Guy. Well. But uh, I wouldn't want to break your hand either, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we could make our own without pounding it ourselves. There's a way that you can make it at home from whole grain rice, like it's supposed to be made, without pounding it. How do you do that? There are actually mochi machines that you can buy and just put on your counter, just like a, a bread maker sort of thing. Ah, I saw there were machines, but I missed that it was made with real rice. I thought you put the flour and mix it with water in the machines. Yeah, you you actually, it, it's really easy. You just like soak the glutinous rice, just like you would at the traditional method. You add some water to the machine so that it can steam it. And then you just turn it on and it does everything for you. It'll steam the rice. And then once it's cooked, there's like this little spinner kind of thing at the bottom that just like rolls all the rice around until it turns into a ball of mochi. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. I, re- cool. I kind of want one. Yeah. Maybe we should get one. Yeah. Just need to find a lot of different foods that we can make with mochi. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Make we'll, a batch every week. We'll get into that. Yeah. But if you do want to use the flour, that makes it even easier, of course. And it's so, so easy if you want to try making your own mochi at home. You know, there are a bunch of videos on YouTube showing you how to do it. You just need to get your hands on that glutinous rice flour, the mochiko. Shouldn't be too hard uh, if you have an Asian market near you. And you just like mix that flour with water and heat it up. You can use a microwave even to heat it up or steam it. And it'll, uh, what's the word? It it gel- jellifies. <laughs> like it, it starts to turn into mochi. Yeah. And then you just kind of knead it until it's smooth and there you go you got a ball of mochi i think you mentioned earlier that there are other ingredients you can add Mm -hmm. but even adding salt or anything can mess with the process and it won't come out correctly so you Mm want to add salt or sugar or cornstarch which prevents sticking any of that stuff you want to add after you're done making the mochi okay i think i saw in one of the videos on youtube they added sugar with the the rice flour before they stuck in the microwave. So I wonder if that, what you just said, might only apply to like if you're making it from the whole grain of rice. Probably, because it said it, it it's harder for it to stick together then. Yeah. When you're pounding it. So yeah. If it's already flour, flour's already so processed and small, yeah, then it's probably easier. Yeah. yeah, you don't need to worry about the homogenization of the mixture. 
Yeah. I think that made sense. I think so too. <laughs> So as we mentioned, mochi has a lot of symbolism in Japan and is associated with many different holidays, but is perhaps most associated with the New Year's holiday. It sure is. Do you know why mochi is a symbol of good luck, Paul? Uh, why is that? I saw that the logic is that since it's sticky and the word mochi sounds the same as the Japanese word to hold or to have, which is mochi mas. Mochi is good for holding on to good luck. Okay. The Japanese like their wordplay. They really, really do. They yeah. do. So yeah, people want to make sure they start a new year with a lot of good luck. So they'll eat a lot of mochi around the New Year's holiday. So this is the time of year when you're going to see a lot of mochi made in the traditional way, especially because people will get together with family and friends to make it together. You know, it's a, a New Year's event that you can share with your loved ones. Yeah, you got some time off for the holiday. It's a good way to spend time together. Yeah. This is also the time of year when mochi makers are going to be selling the most mochi. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So one really important type of mochi for the New Year's holiday is kagami mochi. It's used as a New Year's decoration, actually. Yeah. It usually consists of two round mochi cakes. Balls. Balls, mochi. yeah. There's a smaller one placed on top, a larger one. There's often a dai dai, which is Japanese bitter orange, yeah, placed little, on top as well, too. A little tiny citrus fruit. And I think there was some wordplay there where uh, dai dai means generations. Mm. So the orange symbolizes uh, the continuation of the family from generation to generation. Okay. And that's how that got in there, I guess. And I saw the two balls of mochi is supposed to symbolize like the progression of the years, you know, one year on top of another year and just keeps going. Okay. Um, it also may have a sheet of konbu, which is dried kelp, or even a skewer of dried persimmons underneath the mochi. Yum. It kind of, if you see pictures of it, there's like a lot going on on these little displays. Yeah. It's not just the mochi. Yeah, and there are a lot of little variations I've seen. They can be different sizes and have slightly different elements. So the, this decoration is usually displayed in the home for New Year's. And then a week or so into the New Year, you know, by that time, this kagami mochi has gotten all dry and hard. And there's a ceremony called kagami biraki. And in the ceremony, they break the mochi into pieces with a hammer. And then they'll still eat it to get some more of that luck. Yeah, and they're doing that on the second Saturday or Sunday in January. So that could be like a week or two old. I saw that they would often soften it by adding it to a soup or something. Oh, okay. Make that it easier to eat. Makes a lot of sense. There's also ozoni. It's a soup that families eat on New Year's. Yeah, in the morning on New Year's Day. It's flexible in how it's prepared by family and by region. So there's no one style of ozoni. But one thing they all have in common is the little fluffy rice pillows bobbing in it, which Yummy. is mochi. Yep. Another New Year's specialty is kinako mochi, which is fresh mochi covered in kinako, which is roasted soybean flour. Tasty stuff. Yeah. It's apparently an emblem of luck. Nice. And there's another ceremony that happens after New Year's where all the good luck charms and decorations from the previous year are burned. They have like a big bonfire sort of thing. And people will actually roast mochi over the flames so that it can soak up some of the good luck from those sacred objects that are burning. Yeah. And then I think you dip it into water and then you roll it around in sugar and the kanako. Yum. And that's how you get uh, your kanako mochi. Man. So there's really a lot of ways, as you could see, you could eat mochi. Yeah. And they are really stocking up on that good luck around New Year's, man. <laughs> so many different ways get your luck with that mochi. Yeah, there sure is. So if you want to hear more about other New Year's traditions, last year we did a whole episode about New Year's and other things that go on. So if you want to check that out, episode 25, head on back there. Yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, I thought that was a good one. There's a lot going on at Japanese New Year's. Yeah. I mean, we just talked about mochi on New Year's for like 10 minutes. Yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's so much more. 
Should we talk about some specialty mochis now? Yeah, you know, mochi is a big deal around New Year's, but it's also eaten year round. There are seasonal varieties of mochi. There, there's mochi for other Japanese holidays. What do you got, Paul? One that caught my eye was the sakura mochi. Sakura means cherry blossom. It's mochi stuffed with red bean paste and wrapped in a salted Japanese cherry leaf. And it's known as a symbol of spring because the cherry trees bloom in spring. Yeah, and the mochi is usually pink, too, to look like the cherry blossoms. Ooh, pretty. Yeah. Another spring one is hishimochi. These are these little diamond-shaped cakes, and they have three layers of mochi. One is pink, one is white, and one is green. And this type of mochi is served for Girls' Day on March 3rd. And that diamond kind of shape is supposed to represent fertility. Yeah, I saw that. It's supposed to be healthy. The three colors are all made from healthy ingredients. Nice. Another popular one in spring is kusa mochi. Kusa is grass. This is grass mochi. What are you, a cow? I'm sorry, that was offensive to Do I look like a cow, Paul? (laughs) We were eating grass. Not exactly. Okay. okay. It's, it's green like grass, but it's actually made from Japanese mugwort. That's what gives it the green color and leafy flavor. Okay. That sounds worse than grass. M- mugwort? <laughs> mugwort. Neither of those words is like appealing to me. I'm not really sure exactly what mugwort is, but yeah, it's not <laughs> the most appealing sounding word, I suppose. <laughs> I'm sure it tastes good. Maybe. Uh, That one's also known as yomogi mochi. I think yomogi means mugwort. Okay. It sounds better when I don't know what it means. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Japanese word sounds better. Yeah. Uh, I also read about something called botamochi and ohagi. This is mochi covered in red bean paste, sesame seeds, or roasted soy flour. And the two names apparently refer to pretty much the same thing. But in spring, it's referred to as botamochi. And in fall, it's called ohagi. Yeah, I saw that one. It's really interesting that the filling's on the outside. Yeah. Rather than the inside. Usually there's like a filling covered with mochi. Because mochi's easy to grab. It's not sticky. Right. But this one you would have to eat with chopsticks or just get your fingers sticky or whatever. Yeah. I saw some places said that the texture is slightly different between these two different names or whatever. But it seems like it's pretty much the same thing. So Okay. That was weird. Uh, there's kashiwa mochi, which is a white mochi surrounded by a sweet anko filling with a kishiwa oak leaf wrapped around it. It's made especially for Children's Day, which is in May. Yeah, I saw that oak leaf. It's an interesting wrapping for it. Yeah, I wonder if you're supposed to eat it or not. I don't know about that one. I saw for the sakura mochi, it's kind of optional if you want to eat the leaf or not. I'll never forget uh, that vegan restaurant in Nara where she gave me that dessert wrapped in a leaf and I just started eating it and it tastes the leaf tasted good too it was like kind of minty and then like the owner came by and was like no 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 you don't eat the leaf (laughs) Uh, I felt like a dumb foreigner but it was really good so whatever I thought of that too when I was researching this (laughs) I was just like I don't know I guess I eat it (laughs) Uh, there's yaki mochi which is mochi toasted over a fire or hot coals. Yum. Usually eaten during the winter time. Makes sense. Uh, that one's nice because you got that crispy outside and then a soft, sticky inside. I actually had some of that in Fukuoka when I was there. Yeah, and I guess it starts as like a hard mochi, and then it puffs up and becomes softer as it's heating, but then the outside crisps up and the inside stays soft. Uh, a lot of places make mochi for harvest festivals. They'll harvest a new crop of rice and then use some of that fresh rice right out of the field to make mochi. Yeah. A little ceremony. Uh, very ritualistic again. Yep. Uh, another winter one I saw is Zenzai. Zenzai is so good. I had some of this on my last trip. And Paul, I actually know that you have had this as well. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Zenzai is a, re- a sweet red bean soup with balls of mochi in it. Oh, yeah. You remember that? I think I had that at um, Kiyomizu Dera. 
Exactly. Yeah. I have it a was picture really of you good. with a big smile on your face and a bowl of Zenzai in front of you. Yeah. It was sweet and delicious yeah. and warm. Ah, it was good. Yeah. The bowl I had had a little uh, squirt of whipped cream on top too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Good stuff. So those are some of the types of mochi related with seasons and specific holidays. But there are so, 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 so many other types of mochi out there. One really popular one is daifuku. Yes. It's a big, soft, round mochi filled with anko, which Which, I suppose I just mentioned, I should explain, is sweet red bean paste. Yeah. Just mash up beans and add a bunch of sugar. Yeah. So... At the local Asian Mart, I've been buying little desserts for my lunches, and they're daifuku or daifuku-like, because there's one that's got the red bean paste inside, there's one that's got peanut butter inside, and then it's coated in crushed peanuts. It's so good. There's one with taro inside. Yum. Ah, so good. I love so I, taro. I get like a pack of six of those, and like it's nice, just little small dessert that I can bring with me for my lunches. Yeah. I got the impression that the most basic standard one is the one with red bean paste and just normal mochi. But yeah, there's so many different variations of this. I've seen ones coated in sesame seeds. Uh, I saw one popular one Mm, is you get a strawberry in the middle along with the red bean paste. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the peanut butter one too. Yeah. Yeah, That's good. I've had green tea ones. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those are good. I don't know what exactly that paste is made of. It's like a green tea flavored paste or something in the middle. Yeah. Definitely sweetened. Yeah. There's all sorts of flavored stuff. that will just stick in the middle there. <laughs> you know, in Fukuoka, there's another type of mochi that I had in Chankonabe. Remember that? Hot pot. Yeah. It's the soup that, uh, that sumo wrestlers eat every mm. day. Chankonabe. And I had some of that at the sumo tournament that I went to. And this nabi that I had, had mentai mochi in there, which is mochi filled with fish eggs. So, you know, a lot of the ones we've been talking about, you know, they use mochi in sweet foods, but it can also be savory. It's such a neutral thing, just like rice. You can do anything with it. There's kiri mochi, which is popular for cooking at home. It's these basic blocks of hard mochi in a preserved state cut into rectangles and you can add them to like soups or you can grill them. It's just like an easy way to have mochi available at home. Yeah. The kiri part of that means cut. So this is like cut mochi. And this one popped up when they started mass producing mochi. Basically they found it was faster to just cut it into blocks instead of rolling it into separate little balls. I bet. I bet. Make it affordable. Yep. Yatsuhashi is a Kyoto specialty that looks really good. You got mochi shaped like a triangle with some red bean paste inside. So it's a lot like daifuku, you know, you got the mochi with red bean paste inside. But you can find this either fresh or baked. Oh, baked. And the most unusual part is it's usually flavored with cinnamon, which is a a really unusual spice to see in Japanese foods. That sounds so good, though. Doesn't it? Like baked cinnamon mochi. Yeah. I got to try that. Yeah. Uh, Another one I wanted to talk about is dango. So dango is a dumpling made from rice flour. And in the past, you know, there, there was a distinction between mochi and dango because mochi, like we said, in the traditional way, was made exclusively from grains of glutinous rice. And the dango, historically, it would be made from the rice flour. But as I mentioned these days, a lot of mochi is also made from rice flour. So it seems like the line between mochi and dango has been blurred a bit. Yeah, I don't know if there's really a line anymore. Yeah. What is dango? So, like I said, you got these little round dumplings. And they're normally served as these three little round balls on a skewer. And there are a ton of different kinds of dango. Again, you can flavor them or coat them in all sorts of things. One common one is mitarashi dango, where the balls are coated in a syrup made from soy sauce, sugar, and starch. Yeah, and it's a good street food. Yeah. Because it's on a stick, 
and you can just munch them and it's great. Mm -hmm. I think I I had those at a cone beanie. Okay, yeah. Another common one is Sanshoku Dango, also known as Hanami Dango. And this one is really recognizable because you'll see the three balls on the skewer and each one is a different color. So there's a white one, a pink one, and a green one. And, you know, they call them Hanami Dango because traditionally they were made to eat during Hanami, the cherry blossom viewing. Oh, okay. And each color actually represents something. Oh, you wanna, do you want to guess, Paul? Okay, which color first? Um, let's say pink first. Pink represents the uh, sakura. You got it. What about white? White represents the coming winter. Well, remember, or Hanami, the, uh, Hanami the, is in spring. The winter that just passed. Yeah, it's representing the snow that's like still on the ground, just melting in the spring. And then green. It was the summer to come. Spring grass. It's all about the seasons in Japan. Never go, if you ever in doubt, just guess seasons. <laughs> yeah. It has to do with the seasons. They're important. And actually this, the three-colored dango is so popular. There's even an emoji for it. Oh, nice. Pull out your phone, type in dango, D-A-N-G-O, and you'll find a little picture of it. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Uh, you can also find dango covered in that anko, the sweet red bean paste, sesame paste, Kinako, the roasted soybean flour, like I said, tons and tons of variations. We mentioned it earlier, but my favorite is the mochi ice cream. Ice cream inside mochi. If you haven't tried it, super highly recommend it. Yeah. I think you can get it at a lot of grocery stores in America now. It's becoming so popular. Yeah. Like, even, I think I saw it at Aldi right, once. Right. You can find it in normal grocery stores, not just the Asian markets, but usually at a normal place, you're, you're mostly just going to find like vanilla, green tea, and the red bean flavored ones, I think are the most common. But man, there are so many flavors out there. If you look around a bit, recently I found melon. Oh, that sounds good. That's always a good flavor for anything. I'm always about chocolate. When we're talking ice cream, mm -hmm. chocolate. You know, when I was in Chicago visiting a friend, we went to this market that had cases of like all these different flavors and you can just pick one of each, like grab whatever you wanted. Oh. They had like red velvet mochi ice cream, Ooh. just all these crazy flavors. Birthday cake. I bet they did. <laughs> um, I've had banana, coconut. Ooh. Like, there are a lot of flavors out there if you look around. Yeah, like ice cream. There's a thousand flavors of ice cream. Yeah. And yeah. if there's a flavor of ice cream, you could wrap it in mochi. Sure. Uh, so last, I have to mention this one recent development I heard about. So it's a new type of mochi. Yes. There is this company that came up with this idea around 2000. They took mochi and they stuck it in a waffle iron. Okay. I'm and, with you. And they call the result a moffle. <laughs> <laughs> what? Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> moffle. I just like the word. It does moffle. sound good. I'm not sure about the word. Maybe it'll grow on me. <laughs> All right. Well, you can actually buy moffle makers now. Moffle. You can make it's your fun own. To say. It is. You can buy moffle makers? Moffle makers. How is it different than a waffle maker? I'm not sure how they tweaked it to make it like special for mochi. I mean, if you have a waffle maker, I suppose you could just stick some mochi in there too. Probably. I need to get a waffle maker anyways, because waffles are awesome. Okay, you get the waffle maker. I'll get the mochi maker. We'll make some waffles. <laughs> All right. Then we buy some ice cream. Oh, yeah. And we're good. Yes. <laughs> All right. So there's some of the more common types of mochi, except I don't know how common the waffle is, honestly. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Someday. It'll take, it'll take the world by storm. Yeah. Um, but really, the stuff that we've mentioned, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like There are tons, hundreds of variations that you can find in Japan. Sweet, savory. You know, you'll find mochi used as an ingredient in all sorts of other dishes. And every area in Japan is going to have its own special varieties of mochi treats, of course. So, mm -hmm. so look around. You're bound to find something that you like. So before we end here, I just wanted to talk about a few places that you can try mochi if you're curious now. Maybe you've never had it and you want to give it a try. The easiest way probably to find some mochi is go to your local Asian market. They probably have at least some sort of mochi treat for you. Or, you know, look for the mochi ice cream, like we said. 
you could make it yourself very easily. As we said, look it up on YouTube. I saw in LA specifically, there is a place called Fugetsudo in Little Tokyo. Hmm. Don't recall that. Me either. I spend a lot of time in Little Tokyo, but it's not like in the shopping center areas. Okay. I forget what street it's on, but it's on one of the streets. And uh, it's a, a Japanese confectionery store that specializes in mochi. What? Why did I not know about this when I was in LA? I you know. know. Like, they do have a lot of cool stuff that I did see in Little Tokyo. So yeah. that's nice. Yeah. But this shop has been there since 1903. What? It is the oldest mochi shop in the United States. LA's barely been there since 1903. Really? As we know it today. Yeah. Yeah, LA is a newer newer city. It didn't blow up until uh, the 1900s. Okay. It oh, was yeah. all orange groves back then. Hollywood was all orange plantations. Huh. Cool. Yeah. It must have been some of the first Japanese people in LA, I guess, that started this place. Yeah. It's been passed down through three generations, I believe. That's so cool. And they make mochi the traditional way there. So if you want to taste that old-fashioned mochi that's not mass-produced from the rice flour, go to Fugetsudo. That's awesome. Yep. And of course, if you visit Japan, you'll be able to find mochi all over the place, especially around New Year's. Mm -hmm. Speaking of New Year's, once again, Happy New Year's, everyone. Yes, Happy New Year. One of my very favorite holidays. Just like a good way to get re-centered and refocused and turn a page. I just really like it. I don't know. I still feel a little dirty from 2020. I don't know if I can wash that all off me yet. Well, that's why you do your New Year's cleaning. I like to do a New Year's meditation, you know, so I'm yeah. feeling good. Let's all pig out on a lot of mochi so we can make this next year a decent one. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's it. If you want to see some pictures of mochi-based foods, check out our Instagram. I'll be posting some this week. Uh, we are SJP Podcast there. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash Podcast. If you want to reach out to us, you can do that on either of those places or send us an email to feedback at sightseeingjapanpodcast.com. Paul, what are we talking about next time? Now, the next episode, we're going to be talking about Japanese denim. Oh, yeah. So this episode is probably going to be about seven hours long. If not longer. Because I'm pretty sure Jason could probably talk for 12 hours straight about uh, Japanese denim. Paul had his self-indulgent episode about baseball. Now it's my turn to talk about denim for a very long time. Yeah. I guarantee you will all learn some wild things that you did not know. And you might come away from it needing to get your hands on a pair of Japanese jeans. And I will tell you where you can go to do that. Yeah. Wait till you hear about Jean Street. It's a magical place. Spoiler. <laughs> well, that will be fun, for me at least. Thanks for listening. See you next time.